Um, so let's make a start. Okay, definitions first. Last time, last week, Tuesday and Thursday, we brought our story up to effectively the end of Anglo-Saxon England, and at least in so far politically speaking, as uh, we ceased to have after that point someone who would, can be called an Anglo-Saxon person as king uh, of England. That ends the story politically of Anglo-Saxon England, as I probably said last time, it doesn't mean people cease to be Anglo-Saxons overnight or something. Uh, obviously, it's a more gradual process of uh, changing the culture and people of a country. But uh, in terms of sort of simple politics, um, William the Conqueror winning uh, the Battle of Hastings or his coronation um, two months later, Christmas Day in December 1066, uh, marks the end technically of Anglo-Saxon England. What we're going to look at today and then on Thursday, therefore, uh, very briefly, are the reigns of William and then the reigns of his two sons, William II and Henry I. William II, sometimes called William Rufus, something like red or red-faced or something, I suppose, um, obviously distinguish him from his father. Uh, this diagram, not as complicated as the one we had last time, but indicates the relationship between the Norman, Anglo-Norman, and the, their successors, the Angevin kings. Angevins begin with Henry II here, who was grandson of Henry I through his mother. And in between those guys, we have the slightly anarchic reign of King Stephen, okay, who was grandson of William the Conqueror, but through William's daughter. Okay, so in terms of paternal inheritance, he was Count of Blois, and so on, from his father. So whether we call him Norman or not is debatable, I suppose. But these three guys, we can definitely describe as Norman, and they had or aspired to be uh, Dukes of Normandy, as well as Kings of England. And the dates here are the dates for their kingship. Okay, this is the reign of um, William, William and Henry uh, and their chronology. Okay, just to recap a little bit of what we said before, what's the significance of all this? What's the importance of this? Well, as we said, in terms of politics, we can draw a, a kind of line across there and say so we, we mark a new point of departure, uh, at least uh, technically or whatever. But beyond that, there was uh, the Norman uh, period in England and then the following Angevin period marked significant change in a whole host of ways. The organisation of the country, the nature of the government of uh, England and then subsequently other parts of Britain as well uh, undergoes significant change during the Norman time and later. Uh, we see the government of an organisation of England being a mixture, I suppose, of Anglo-Saxon things, Norman things, and then some new things that these guys kind of come up with as well. And Henry in particular is attributed with being a very big governor, um, Henry II, but he was picking up on, to some extent, what some things that had been going on a little bit earlier. Okay, And the nature of uh, government in medieval and early modern England, and even today, some things owe their origin to this period. Okay, so a very big uh, point of, of development. We'll also say a little bit about what happens in the church, the changing nature of, of religious organization in uh, England during this time. And I mentioned last time, I think, the fate of the English language, if we go into pure, more popular culture, whatever, the decline of the use of English, the growth of the use of French for a while, uh, and obviously Latin as well. And only later do we get um, uh, English being used more significantly. And it's worth saying that these guys and quite a lot of their successors were kings of England, but 
knew little English, okay, and certainly were not native English speakers. Uh, they would have learned some English uh, 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 gradually, but they were not able to speak English properly and so on. Only uh, a little bit later on, the later Middle Ages, till we actually say kings of England spoke English from childhood and so on. So that's quite a significant point to make, I suppose. Okay, so let's look at, let's start with William. Okay, he's won the Battle of Hastings. Harold has been killed. William, you remember, claims that he is the rightful, the legal, the le legitimate king of England. He claims that Harold uh, broke a promise and that Edward had actually promised the throne uh, to William. So that was how he justified his invasion. He wins the battle at Hastings, as we talked about last time. And as I just said, he gets to, Ro he gets to London and is crowned king on Christmas Day. Uh, that's all very nice. And of course, one of the problems of doing history is you have this kind of retrospective view. William was a very strong and powerful king and organizer, and the kingdom he developed uh, and his successors inherited from him was a, was a growing, strong kingdom. But in the early years after the conquest, after 1066, uh, things could have gone in various ways. We've already had the Danish guys, Svein, Fort Beard, Canute, and his sons as kings of England. We've already had foreigners coming in and imposing themselves on England through various means, uh, primarily military, but still Anglo-Saxons came back. So it's always possible in these early days that things could have gone either way. But we talk about William's reign as kind of a successful thing, but in the early days, like any coup d'etat or anything, okay, things are a bit chaotic. Uh, he's got significant control in the south, but particularly up in the north, okay, things are a little bit dodgy. So um, this map here is kind of partly to uh, illustrate that point. <coughs> it's not so clear. Every time I move, it kind of jumps and then I'll stand somewhere. But uh, really only from 1070, late 1070 onwards, do we see... Uh, William's situation becoming more strong and consolidated uh, in a large part of England. The early days, we have a series of attempts by people to um, uh, undermine his rule, a series of rebellions and things like that. Okay. So he's in a difficult position. It's a military conquest, and the first thing he does, obviously, is to try and uh, re-establish his position. Now, a lot of the Anglo-Saxon aristocrats, a good number of them, had obviously been killed in Hastings, or perhaps at Stamford Bridge a bit earlier. A lot of the landowners, not all of them, but a good number of them. And one of the things which William does gradually during his reign is replace the leading landholders, the leading aristocrats, the Anglo-Saxon aristocrats in England, of various levels, very powerful ones down to less powerful ones, with Norman and French supporters, people he feels that he can trust. Okay. And this takes a gradual, it's a gradual process. And he eventually comes up with the idea of kind of divide and rule. So with one or two exceptions, he makes sure that people have a little bit of land here, and a little bit of land there. He tries to avoid one of his Norman supporters having too much big territory under his control in one place. Okay. Because then there's the danger that person can even come to threaten the king. Okay. He has some problems early in the reign, but this is the pattern which we see, particularly when we look at Doomsday Book, the way he's distributed the land and things like that. So we have one or two people who are quite powerful magnates for one reason or another in one area. But in general, he tries to kind of split up their lands to ensure that no one or, or two people can kind of threaten his position. And he uses feudal processes to uh, establish this. Okay. They also embark on a program of building castles. Okay. Uh, one of the ways to strengthen your position is to build some kind of military fortification, uh, wooden temporary ones at the fir first, and then obviously uh, more uh, uh, permanent uh, fortifications later, which will be the basis for individual lords, but will also be the basis uh, for royal power as well. Okay. So. Um, Distributing lands, 
dividing and ruling and establishing a new set of uh, people underneath you, and then um, this gradual process of, uh, of supporting your conquests through castles. And these little dots here you can see are important early Norman castles that are being built. And this map, showing the later situation, comes in focus. And again, this isn't great, unfortunately, in terms of the focus. But all the writing here are different landholders, and all the dots are manors or castles established uh, under uh, a local ruler or by uh, the king himself. The interesting thing is there's a big pattern here, you can see, and it's a bit thinner as we go up. The north still remains uh, potentially a problem area for uh, William. In the early days, his main supporters, his main Norman supporters, that's not right on this board, it's upside down. His half-brother, Otto of Bayeux, okay, whom we've mentioned before, and then another important Norman called William, uh, sorry, what am I doing? William Fitz Osborne. You may have come across the surname element Fitz. I don't know if anyone's come across this. There might be some Fitz people in, living in America, Jenkins. Have you come across Fitzpatricks and these kind of things? Anyone know what Fitz, where it comes from? Hmm? It sounds like that, Fritz or something, no? <laughs> you three possibly using it quite a lot at the moment with Paul. It derives from Phileas, son. Okay, so this is a patronymic, William, son of Osborne. It's not clear. Okay. Um, and obviously in the Latin documents, he would have been called Wilhelmus Filius Osberni or something like that. The Fitz is a, is a kind of spoken uh, version. I'm not sure exactly when it emerges and so on. But, so if you come across quite a lot of Normans and uh, early uh, I mean, central medieval guys called Fitz something, then it's, uh, it's usually a patronymic, which then becomes a surname. Okay, so uh, that's the nature of these things. It's a good way to spot the Normans at this point. Right, okay, yes. Uh, which may be, okay, quite a lot of these Fitz guys ended up in Ireland when the Irish move in, when the Normans move into Ireland. And so Fitzpatrick's and Fitzgerald's, I suspect, are all descended from uh, uh, Irish or Anglo-Irish uh, uh, families and so on of one sort or another. Okay, this map shows just some of the uh, at early attempts against... Um, uh, uh, William. Uh, 1086, we have some troubles down here and into the West Country. Okay. Uh, 1068, sorry, 1086. 1068. In 1069, there is a kind of invasion, an attempted invasion at different stages from Denmark, okay, which was very important. Finally, established itself briefly, gets into York and in the north, where obviously Norman power was. Um, quite low, and our friend Edgar Atheling is kind of mixed in with all this. Who is Edgar Atheling? Anyone remember from last week? Spell. Yeah, how? What's his claim? What's his claim to fame? Yeah, he was the grandson of Edmund Ironside, who was the son of Ethelred the Unready. So he is actually the one person who, in theory, uh, was an Anglo-Saxon member of the, Anglo the, la the last English Anglo-Saxon royal family. Okay? And Atheling means kind of prince or heir or some royal heir or something here. Okay? And um, obviously, that's, he's theoretically a key figure here. I don't know how charismatic and how much he actually tried himself, but he becomes the focus for some of these attempts, and he's somehow, I think, involved in some of this business in the north and so on. Okay. Um, and then what happens is that most all of these rebellions and attempts at uh, uh, undermining William's power get put down by William or his supporters, and uh, 1069 to 70 business up here leads to a significant 
event the, called the Harrying of the North, where basically William and his army say, OK, we've had enough of these guys in the north. They just move up and destroy a lot of places, land, and so on, OK, um, as a sort of scorched earth policy to stop uh, local people and other rebels trying to sort of work out there. So they, they punish the north for having supported uh, the Danes and Edgar and others in their attempts at somehow undermining them. Okay. And uh, the situation in the north is quite significantly damaged, kind of not politically but economically for quite a long time as a result. But it was a big event uh, after um, these problems. He has relations, uh, William has relations with uh, Wales and Scotland at this time as well, okay. In, uh, now I'll get my years correct, okay. In 1072, okay, uh, I think he uh, goes up to Scotland on the basis of establishing some kind of position in the north, of course. And the Scottish king Malcolm Canmore, king of Scotland, submits to um, uh, uh, William. So he recognizes William as an overlord. Now, the interesting thing is that Malcolm was married to a lady called Margaret, who was the sister of. Edgar Atheling, and subsequent kings of Scotland are descended from uh, this line, so um, there is more Anglo-Saxon royal blood in the kings of medieval kings of Scotland than there were, in fact, amongst the uh, medieval kings of England, ironically enough. But, uh, so Malcolm was an interesting and potentially dangerous position because he was married into uh, Athelred's family, so uh, the submission by uh, Malcolm, if not willing, that was an important point as well. And he doesn't make any great uh, territorial claims against the Scots, but he has this political submission. But the situation in Wales is different. Okay, in 1081. William himself makes some kind of what they're often called a pilgrimage, Hajj or something, to St. David's, very important church in the south of Wales, okay, named after the saint after whom I'm named. We've talked about him before. Some kind of movement this way, okay. Um, and exactly what that was, it was surely not a religious motivated pilgrimage. It had political motivations as well. But during his uh, reign, during uh, William's reign and a bit afterwards, we see the gradual encroachment uh, by uh, the Normans into, particularly into the southern parts of Wales and into the north. Okay, we'll talk a bit more about these later. Uh, theoretically, the whole of Wales uh, was in danger of becoming Norman, but then political events changed that. But he, the Normans are pushing not just the king, but individual Norman lords are establishing themselves in Wales at that time as well. Okay. Now, ironically enough, from 1073 until his death in 1087, William spent very little time in England. He spent most of that time in Normandy. Remember, although he's now king, he is also still Duke of Normandy, and he spends a lot of his time after he's consolidated his position and to some extent dealt with the North and with the Scots. He spends a lot of his time in Normandy um, dealing with his French neighbors and enemies and other things and obviously not wishing to lose his position there. So he's not a, a hands-on king in that respect. And this is important because it shows us the early, early on it shows us the dual problem which the Norman and then the Angevin kings had, which is that they seem to have these two realms, these two uh, areas that they were interested in. And it's difficult to be king of England and be a hands-on king of England, and at the same time uh, to be 
uh, an active and effective Duke of Normandy where you've got a very uh, volatile situation as well. So uh, at some points we get one guy being King of England and Duke of Normandy and as we shall see at some points we get two brothers, one being Duke and the other one being King. So uh, those are different solutions or, or results of this problem. And what's the other and it becomes more important later on, particularly for the Angevins, what's the other big issue which this, the conquest of England creates, in a sense, for the Dukes of Normandy and their successors in terms of the situation on the continent? France. I mean, I, mean, I was going to ask you this. Like, how does that work? I mean, technically, I mean, even though the French kid is the king of Sweden, Yeah, you know, you're, I mean, we're not going to answer all those questions now because those questions become even bigger and more of an issue when we look at the Angevins because what Henry II does, okay, is he takes this whole process a lot more. So as well as being King of England and Duke of Normandy up there in the northern bit of France, he controls in one way or another, okay, a large part of France. He actually directly and one diff for different reasons controls, in a sense, more of France than the King of France does. Okay? And that sets up a very big problem, both his relationship to uh, the King, but also, of course, uh, his relationship to other French noblemen and things like that. And, um, well, uh, Marta's going to be looking at the figure of Richard the Lionheart in her essay and so on. He's, uh, he went on crusade, he was king of England, and he spent a lot of his time arguing with the king of France and things like that. They were, in theory, equals, but as you're saying, also there was a hierarchy between them. And William's conquest of England sets up, creates that problem, because William and his successors were, if they were dukes of Normandy, were vassals of the king of France. And as the kings of France gradually establish their position more effectively in France, it becomes a real uh, relationship and a real problem. But on the other hand, uh, they're also kings of England. So you've hit, you've hit the real problem here. And we'll, we won't talk about it too much this week, but next week we'll see this problem uh, on a larger scale, I hope. The other big event, although towards the end of um, William's reign, is 1086. He establishes or forms the Doomsday Survey, which we're going to look at and discuss, I hope, together on Thursday. I mean, basically, towards the end of his reign, though he wasn't aware he was about to die uh, shortly afterwards, of course, but uh, now that things have been consolidated in England, and obviously he feels his position in Normandy is secure, he says basically, let's get the big map. He says basically, okay guys, we've now got all of this land directly under my control, and bits of this land indirectly under my your control, but ultimately everything comes to me because in this area I am the ultimate lord, okay, and everyone else are vassals below me. I've given you bits of land here, 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 and bigger sometimes, sometimes smaller, okay. What's it all worth to us? What was the situation before we came? How have things changed since, particularly in the north, okay, things have changed as I said. What's it worth to us? What kind of taxation can we get? How much land is there? How many pigs are there? And so on, okay. So they established this massive survey which becomes known later as the Doomsday Survey and gets encoded in an incomplete series of manuscripts which we call Doomsday Book. Okay? And it's, uh, for its time, it's a, it's a great achievement. Okay? It's a, a massive historical uh, source which surveys uh, the economics and other aspects of uh, England and parts of Wales and uh, provides a very important source for historians. So we'll look at that then. Unfortunately, the following year, William dies, 
and whether for that reason or other reasons, because the Doomsday Book is debated these days, uh, the process seems to have stopped. Okay, that process of surveying seems to stop. So William dies, ten eighty-six, and he had an earlier son called Richard, who had died shortly before, about six years earlier. Um, so he's left with three sons. Richard was, I think, the second. I think he was the second one. Okay. Robert was the eldest, and he gets Normandy. Then it's Richard, but he's dead. Then we get William, who gets England, and Henry, who'd been born after the Norman Conquest and so was quite young, uh, isn't involved at this stage, but he becomes king later on. Okay, he gets other things, but he's not part of the story. So William dies, Normandy goes to Robert Curtos, and William II, William Rufus, gets England. He succeeds his father. Okay. William Rufus is one of these kings who has got a rather negative reputation amongst the historians. Okay? Not necessarily modern historians, but contemporary historians, people at the time. Uh, the big bad boys are Stephen and John because of their mismanagement uh, or whatever of things. Uh, they go down in history, as we say, as bad kings. And it's interesting that no one afterwards, no king of England afterwards, decided to call their son John, who might become a king, or Stephen. Okay, I'm not saying 100% that there was no John or Stephen amongst the royal families, but the two bad guys in particular, par excellence in a sense, in people's minds, those names never recur as kings of England. So this isn't John the first, it's just King John, at least so far, of course. Who knows what uh, future kings and queens of England might do. William Rufus, not quite as seen, not quite as a bad light, and obviously having the name William, uh, that name is permitted to recur as it does uh, subsequently, but um, not for a while. The main problem is that William Rufus had fairly poor relations with the church after a certain point. And as we've seen when we looked at the Vikings, if the churchmen don't like you much, and they're the ones that write the historical sources, they don't always write nice things about you, and then later people reading your books write a kind of negative view of your history. Now, he was in a difficult kind of position, okay, partly, uh, and uh, he relied very heavily on, or he was supported quite significantly by Lanfranc, who was Archbishop of Canterbury and a very powerful figure during. Uh, William I's reign, okay, and uh, a couple of years later, 1089, Lanfranc dies, so this important supporter from the church dies. William, by various means, persuades, eventually, after a few years, persuades a guy called Anselm, who was abbot of Beck, to become Archbishop of Canterbury, but then quite early they kind of fall out, they cease to be friends. And if you've got the king in London, but the Archbishop of Canterbury in Canterbury obviously not getting on, then you've got potential problems uh, for uh, the kingdom in general. Okay, it's not the last time that you find uh, the king and uh, the Archbishop falling out. Okay, and William was almost excommunicated. Uh, at one point during their arguments. Do we know what excommunication is? Anyone wish to say what excommunication involves or involved? Still involves in theory. The, the church doesn't recognize you and they don't communicate with you, obviously. <laughs> but they, yeah, yeah, okay, they don't okay. Communic you perform in the church ceremony services well, yeah, it's the ho Holy Communion. I mean, okay. The Sorry? The church sends you out. 
Yeah, yeah. Effectively, you're not permitted to come to church and partake in communion, which is uh, ultimately it's receiving the uh, the body and blood of Christ in the form of uh, wine and bread or whatever, however you see it, and that's the key to keeping your soul in a good position. So if you're not allowed to come and participate, then until the church forgives you and you'll come back into things, in, if you die, your soul may or may not go to heaven, probably might go to hell. Obviously, that's the key. So it's a bad thing, and it's, and it's a very powerful tool, particularly against kings and things like that, to excommunicate them. So uh, relations between William and... Uh, uh, Anselm was so bad that at one point the Pope almost excommunicated him, okay, so removed him from the communion uh, of the church and so on. In addition, uh, William himself, this is what they say, was very interested in knighthood and military prowess, a bit like our friend Genghis here, military history and stuff like that. And obviously the church were thinking he's kind of giving, to use the Turkish phrase, giving too much importance to all that stuff and not thinking about government and religious issues and so on. So a mixture of kind of personal style and unfortunate relations gave him this, this in a sense, bad reputation. And during his reign, uh, we see a number of attempts to kind of oppose him in various ways, okay, including in 1088, so very early on, there was an attempt uh, by some Normans, okay, including his uncle, Odo Bayer, okay, uh, to um, establish Robert as king, okay, uh, but this failed. Uh, and Robert didn't come to kind of support them. But it shows that early on, a lot of the important figures from the previous reign were not happy with the position of William. And then with William Rufus, and he doesn't really make things better in terms of his uh, behavior and so on. 1091, I'm running out of space here. <laughs> 1091, I'll change pens. William himself invades Normandy and defeats his older brother, Robert. And uh, they come to uh, a kind of uh, an agreement. Okay. But then, five years later, 1096, Robert uh, goes on the first cruise, planning to go on the first crusade, and so they come to a new establishment that is that William can control Normandy as a kind of regent in his brother's absence. Okay, and I'm sure William's rubbing his hands and thinking, "Here we go. He's going to get killed by all those Turks, uh, and therefore it's all going to be mine." Ha 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 ha, and so on. Okay, but Robert, obviously, being for whatever reason, inspired to go on the crusade that was being planned at that time, okay, um, uh, needs to have some arrangement. So William makes a big tax on England to support his brother's crusade attempt. And obviously, sorry? So did William the first see Normandy in accordance? Why wouldn't he have gave the eldest brother the king of the land? I think this is debated. I, I think. Uh, it's the traditional um, uh, Norman inheritance, and it's the sort of focus of them. So, yeah, I think for him, it was the it was the key one in a sense. And but obviously, in England was the bigger place and had potentially more wealth, and so we do find uh, struggles between the two. But as you see, William himself wanted to have Normandy as well, so it's seen as part of the two two sides of that coin, in a way. So we've got a situation where William is indirectly controlling Normandy while his brother's on crusade. But then, unfortunately, he gets uh, killed and uh, things change even further. I haven't got time to go into that now. The story of his death is slightly controversial. It's said that he was on some kind of a hunting expedition with some friends and he gets kind of lost in the woods and a guy called William Tyrrell gets him with an arrow. Now, some accounts say this was accidental, okay, that 
he saw something moving to shoot and shot, and then it gets the king by mistake or whatever. And then sort of, whoops, oh dear, I've killed the king kind of thing. Uh, and then, obviously, the church accounts present it more as this is God's intervention punishing this bad guy who'd fallen out with uh, Archbishop Anselm and so on, which obviously we can't use that interpretation for a modern historical uh, uh, analysis. Um, others have suggested that there was more going on. There were some political machinations going on. Even that Henry, uh, William's brother, was somehow uh, involved in arranging his brother's death or something like that. Uh, no one was actually there, as far as we can see, apart from the guy with the bow and the arrow and William. So there's no way of actually being certain one way or the other. It's one of these things that historians obviously will argue and debate about uh, ad infinitum. So we can't be certain that he was assassinated rather than killed in an accident. Um, possibly the accident was the truth, but we don't know certainly, okay. Um, but then that throws things into chaos, because he was still relatively young, and he was still in a good position to keep ruling the kingdom for a while. But unfortunately, tempers fugit, time flies. We must leave the story there. And very briefly, I'll say a bit about uh, Henry I on Thursday and Azra will give her presentation. But for the rest of you, here we have Doomsday Book for Herefordshire. I'm giving you one of the most important historical sources for the Middle Ages, or part of it. The other guys are not here. Again, this will not make exciting bedtime reading, okay? It'll help you get to sleep. It won't uh, keep you awake at two o'clock or something waiting. It's not going to be Dan Brown, the last symbol, waiting for the end of the story or something. Have a go at having a look at that with a critical analytical eye. Don't expect to read it from the first word to the end. Work your way through it, see how it's organized, see what it's trying to do, and then we'll discuss this together on Thursday. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. See you in two days' time. And Azra, if you need to contact me, well, please let me know what, how you're, where you're up to and so on, so we can plan together a little bit.